Today, we're with Bill Burkett in Sun City, Arizona, looking at one of the 20th century's rarest electronic artifacts, the world's first solar-powered consumer product. This Admiral Radio sports a nice deep V trim motif as well as the figure of an atom on the front. How mid-century can you get? This is a radio at home in any radio or mid-century modern collection, but there's much more to interest a collector in this radio, namely its solar power option. That's right, this radio could be had with an optional sun power pack, making it the first solar-powered radio ever available. Collectors know that in late 1954, Regency made the first commercially available transistor radio. Regency was quickly followed by several other U.S. radio manufacturers, including Emerson, Magnavox, Motorola, GE, RCA, Raytheon, and Zenith, who all introduced their own transistor radios during 1955. Chrysler, the car maker, even offered an optional transistor radio in some of their cars. Seemingly, everyone wanted to get on a transistor radio bandwagon. Yet there was one prominent American radio manufacturer who had not yet produced a transistor radio. But they were working on it, and they were hoping to bring to market not just a radio, but a totally new concept in electronic technology. They planned to market not just a transistor radio, but a solar-powered transistor radio. Now, solar cell technology was brand new in 1955. The first practical solar cell was invented just a year earlier, in 1954. Invented at Bell Labs, the very place the transistor itself was invented just eight years prior, in 1947. And so, in August 1955, the Admiral Corporation of Chicago set out to outdo the other radio makers with a radio that was not just transistor, but was solar, too. That same month, August of 1955, was a milestone in the history of consumer electronics for another reason, on another continent. Right, Bill? Oh, definitely. That was the very month in which Tokyo Shushin Kogyo released to the Japanese market Japan's first transistor radio, the Sony TR-55. The first product ever to bear the name Sony. That's the one. But back in Chicago, Admiral Engineers Harry Thanos and Roger Weber had acquired seven small silicon solar energy cells, each about the size of a half a dollar coin. These came from the Semiconductor Division of National Fabricated Products of Chicago and cost $25 each. The engineers wired the seven cells in series to create a one and a half volt sun battery, which Mr. Thanos connected to a prototype six transistor radio. On August the 26, 1955, he demonstrated the prototype sun radio to representatives of Mallory an Indianapolis maker of batteries and electronic components. By the way, the P.R. Mallory Company helped develop the modern alkaline battery and is today better known by the name of their most successful product, Duracell. Anyway, this prototype radio shown to Mallory operated entirely on sunlight without batteries. Now, why would they be making a presentation to a battery company of a radio that doesn't need batteries? That's a little like showing your wife pictures of your new girlfriend. <laughs> well, I'm guessing that occurred to a few of those Mallory people, too, and probably raised a few eyebrows at the meeting. But Admiral was looking to Mallory to supply higher-performing transistors for the radio from Mallory's Electronics Components Division, and perhaps as a possible source for the solar cells. Well, yeah, that makes sense. And was Mallory the source for the cells in the sun power packs? Well, it could be, but we have no proof yet. Back in development, circuitry dubbed Automatic Sun Control, or ASC, was developed to improve the radio's solar function in practical use. This reduced the radio's bad habit of getting louder and quieter depending on the brightness of the sun, a particularly annoying thing on partly cloudy days. 
Also, a rechargeable nickel-cadmium battery was added that could be charged by solar cells during the daylight hours and allow the radio to operate at night. Admiral announced this new prototype on October 21, 1955. The Chicago Tribune picked up the story and published it along with a picture of the radio on October 28th, describing how Harry Thanos had conceived, created, and demonstrated the world's first solar-powered radio. The rechargeable NICAD battery idea was subsequently dropped and never made it into production models. So the radio operated off the solar pack or the batteries, but the solar pack never fed the batteries in this radio or recharged them. That idea did appear later in a solar radio made by Hoffman. More on them later. So Admiral wasted no time in developing and bringing this radio to market. In just six short months, this radio went from experimental model to finished consumer product. And so in April of 1956, they were already distributing working display models to dealers around the country and taking purchase orders for their new radio. Admiral staged a publicity event on May 10, 1956, in Dallas, Texas. That day, Admiral executives personally delivered the first production model of this new solar radio to customer number one, the first buyer. He was a Mr. Eugene Germany, president of Lone Star Steel. He was a man who, according to the recalled memories of his grandchildren, many years later, was always one to be first in line for any new technology. What we might call today an early adopter. Bill, you talked to those grandchildren, didn't you? Well, email. I guess that's some kind of talking. I tracked them down looking for that radio. They recalled to me how proud their grandfather was of it. What they couldn't recall was where that radio is now. I want it but no one seems to know what became of it. But you know, Bill, perhaps you already have it. Perhaps it is one of these already in your collection. Well, I don't know if I like that idea or not. I'm on a hunt for that radio. It's strange to think I might already have it. Well, I'm just saying. Tell us more about this Admiral Solar Radio. The Admiral 7L is a six transistor radio and holds six regular D-cell flashlight batteries. It can run for about 700 hours on those batteries, and that's about two hours of use a day for a full year. In the 1950s, those batteries would cost you 15 cents each, and so 90 cents worth of batteries would run the radio for a full year of typical use. The radio's list price was $59.95 without the solar option, and indeed, the vast majority of them were sold without that solar option. That $60 price was pretty much in line with other transistor models available at the time. While a similar radio with vacuum tubes could be had for $30 or $40, transistor products did command a premium. Now, if you were wanting the solar power option, that was going to cost you more. Oh yes, the Sun Power Pack option was available for an additional price of, <laughs> are you ready? $185, later reduced to $175. Well, that's better. The yellow and black display tag said the solar pack would power the radio for a lifetime, for free, but at the cost of $185 versus 90 cents for flashlight batteries, it would take over 205 years to break even. 205 years. So, like what? Eat your vegetables, I guess. <laughs> the Admiral 7L was available in a choice of four different two-tone color combinations. The cabinets were stylish and somewhat similar to an earlier tube-type Admiral portable radio, which also had the same rotoscope pop-up antenna just under the handle. This 7L series transistor radio, however, also displays the atomic symbol as did a few other American radios, such as some Raytheon and Sylvania models. Oh yeah, jet wings, flying Vs, fins, and atomic symbols were synonymous with high-tech in the mid-1950s and were used wherever a marketer wished to stake the claim of advanced technology, whether or not the thing blasted off or flew or glowed in the dark. The four color combinations were described like this, holiday red and polar white, 
That's the 7L12 model. The Arizona tan and polar white is the 7L14 model. Tropic yellow and polar white was the 7L16 model, and the 7L18 model was turquoise and, can you guess, polar white. On the back side of the radio was a jack for plugging in the solar pack, below which it says sun power. When the sun pack cord was plugged in, it automatically disconnected the internal batteries, and the radio would then depend solely on the solar pack for power. The sun pack contains 32 silicon solar cell elements, which would generate 9 volts or more in good sunlight. The solar cells could also power the radio indoors from the light of an ordinary household light bulb. That is, in fact, how the radio was demonstrated inside the radio shops and stores in which it was sold. When not plugged into the radio, the sun pack could be stored in a zippered pocket on the back of the custom leather carrying case. And even that case was an option at extra cost and was going to cost you another $40. It's easy to see why so very few people jumped at the chance to drop 275 of 1956 dollars for the whole package. 275. How much would that be in today's money? That's about 2700 dollars for a radio. For an AM radio. Yes, an AM only radio. So anyway, very few of the Admiral Solar Packs were sold, and of course, even fewer have survived. It is doubtful that more than a few hundred Solar Packs were ever made. While the radio alone is somewhat scarce, the Sun Power Pack is exceedingly rare, and the custom carrying case even more so. Let's stick a radio out in the sun and see what happens. You know, there weren't a lot of solar cells around in 1956. With the price Admiral had to pay for those cells, this was likely a money-losing proposition for Admiral all around. But, you know, I'm sure they were banking on the prestige such a high-tech product would give the company, expecting that prestige to help sales up and down the line of products they made. And they made plenty. There were Admiral televisions and phonographs, and refrigerators, and air conditioners, and electric ranges. The high-tech halo over all these products that this solar radio would have generated was short-lived, though. A competitor, the Hoffman Radio Corporation of Los Angeles, released their first solar radio the next year. There's a video all about that Hoffman 1957 solar radio, on this channel. Oh, I've seen that video. How'd you like it? Words. (laughs) Simply can't describe it. No, I don't suppose they can. And so with hopes dashed that their solar radio would be a sales winner or would help propel their image to high-tech heights, Admiral took a second look at the other ideas and plans for solar power devices that they had in the works. These included a portable record player and another smaller transistor radio, the 6S series. Although, as you can see, pictures, descriptions, and model numbers were shown in Admiral Dealer literature in 1956, there is no evidence that even a single example of this smaller solar radio was ever made or sold. Listed in the same colors as the 7L series sets, These smaller, pocket-sized models were given model numbers 6S22, 6S24, 6S26, and 6S28. They were to use what appeared to be the same Sun Power Pack as the larger sets. No price was ever advertised for these models, and as I say, it is assumed that none were ever made. But Admiral did make the very similar 7M series of radios as shown in this ad from Holiday Magazine. But no examples of the 6S series solar version has ever been found. Still, I wonder. Well, Bill, it could happen. And you're just the guy it would happen to. You're just the guy to find one of these little Admiral solar radios. 
or two or four in each of the colors with the solar packs.